the day of reckoning is coming. How Revelation parallels the death of the firstborn Egyptians. What's the most famous judgment of God of all time? Well, it's probably a toss-up between Noah's flood and the death of the firstborn in Egypt. They were very similar, but since this is the third installment in a series about Passover and the plagues of Egypt and how they're repeated in the book of Revelation and in the future, you can pretty well tell that today we're speaking about the 10th plague, the death of the firstborn Egyptians on the night of the Passover. It was the day of reckoning. In the first nine plagues, God had judged the Egyptian little g-gods in various ways leaving the people of Egypt economically and spiritually devastated. Then came the 10th plague, the one from which they could not recover. In Exodus 12, we learn the angel of the Lord killed the firstborn of the Egyptians and the firstborn of all their livestock. And the Bible is specific. The Lord struck down the firstborn of Egypt from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on the throne That mention of his throne is important. To the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon. Exodus 12, 29. Now, we could just read past this verse as we often do and miss what's going on. Remember, in the previous videos, we have discussed that Pharaoh was thought to be the physical incarnation of their god Horus himself. So when Pharaoh said something, it was like, Horus saying something. And of course, Pharaoh's heir was thought to be Horus as well. So when that heir died, it was like Horus himself dying. To the Egyptians and to Pharaoh, the death of this heir was our true God, Yehovah, killing Horus, their God, in our last video. And a link's down in the description. We discussed how, in the previous plague, the ninth plague, the plague of darkness, to the Egyptians, God appeared to blot out their supreme god, Ra, the sun god, and the eye of Ra, their number one symbol, the source of their afterlife and immortality. Now, in this plague, our god appeared to kill one of their gods. These two events cast overwhelming doubt on the Egyptian religion and their afterlife. This was likely crippling to Pharaoh and his noblemen and his court. Now famously, the firstborn of Israel who had been protected by blood on the doorposts and lintels did not die. God said this to Moses, kill the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that's in the basin and touch the lintel and the doorposts with the blood that's in the basin. None of you shall go out of the door of his house until morning. For the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lintel and the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to enter your houses to strike you. Exodus 12, 21 through 23. Jesus, of course, is our Passover lamb, as we see in 1 Corinthians 5, 7. It is his blood and only his blood that will save you. If you remember, the previous nine plagues, they did not affect the areas where the Israelites were staying. It was dark in Pharaoh's capital city, but not in Goshen where the Israelites were. But this plague, this plague was different. The Israelites had to do something specific to avoid the destroyer angel. They had to paint their door frames and lintels. They had to paint the blood of a lamb, symbolically the blood of Christ, on their door frames. No one was saved just because they were an Israelite anymore. They were given a warning, but they had to act in faith to actually be saved. This is super important. The 10th plague was a plague of decision. They could have believed that the blood would save them all they wanted, but if they didn't actually paint it on their door frames and lintel, they weren't saved. The destroyer came into the house. Does this mean that some Israelite families didn't paint their doorposts? Yes, I imagine. There was ridicule for them doing this in some areas of the Hebrew cities that refused Moses' commands. 
I can also imagine in other places the families of the Egyptian overlords and slave masters were actually begging the Israelites to take cover inside the Israelite homes that had the blood. They knew how powerful the Israelite God was. They had seen it in the first nine plagues, and they knew how powerless their gods were to stop what was coming. So in faith, these Egyptians asked to enter the Israelite homes. Remember, everyone within the home who had painted blood on their doors were saved. The masters, the Egyptians, became the beggars. And I'm sure that many faithful Israelites accommodated them and hid them in their homes. People might say, why, that would have been against Torah. But remember, Torah wasn't even instituted at this point in time. The next day, when Israel left Egypt, they left as a mixed multitude, which means they left not just as Hebrews, but Egyptians as well. Many Egyptians likely converted to the worship of the one true God after this ordeal with the plagues and became part of Israel. Caleb, from the tribe of Judah, one of two faithful spies, you know, Joshua and Caleb, had Egyptian blood. We shouldn't think of this plague as striking down the Egyptians, but rather as striking down the unrepentant. That's a big difference. Vast numbers of Egyptians then were ready to leave with Moses and Aaron the following morning. This makes Pharaoh's eventual sending of his chariots after the Israelites into the sea all the more understandable. Not only was he seeking revenge on them, but his government and power were rocked, decimated, and he was humbled. If he didn't send his charioteers after Moses, there probably would have been a coup against him by his nobles and the landowners. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, the mind of Pharaoh and his servants was changed toward the people. And they said, what is this we have done? That we have let Israel go from serving us? So he made ready his chariot and took his army with him and took 600 chosen chariots and all the other chariots of Egypt with officers over all of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued the people of Israel while the people of Israel were going out defiantly. Exodus 14, 5 through 8. Where in the book of Revelation, however, do we see something very similar to this? Where in the book of Revelation does Israel have to make a decision to follow Jesus and paint the blood, so to speak, on their doorposts? Well, in Revelation 7, 1 through 8, we see 144,000 from the tribes of Israel being sealed. Now, this is a difficult to understand passage. Many view this being sealed as being protected. And certainly, they are being protected. But in the New Testament, the word sealed always refers to being saved being sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, painting the door frames of their hearts with the blood of the Lamb. Just a few verses later, we see an enormous multitude from every tribe, nation, and language, not just the Israelite tribes, but every tribe, including the Israelites, therefore, before the throne of God in heaven. They suddenly appeared there according to John, obviously the result of the rapture, about this entire multitude, Israelites and others, we are told, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in, wait for it, the blood of the Lamb. Revelation 7, 14. There it is, the blood of the Lamb, right in that passage. So this saving and protecting of an Israelite remnant is parallel in Revelation to the Passover. And the key is that phrase, blood of the lamb. And reading on, it is not much later in Revelation, at the sixth trumpet, one third of the population of the earth, still remaining on earth at that time, die from fire and brimstone, cast upon them by killer angels. The image is very similar to what happened in the Passover. 
And how do those who survive the fire and brimstone react? Well, just like Pharaoh did, with pride and arrogance. The rest of mankind, who were not killed by these plagues, did not repent of the works of their hands, nor give up worshiping demons and idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood, which cannot see or hear or walk, nor did they repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. Revelation 9, 20 through 21. So these folks who survived did not repent. The parallel is right there between the 10th plague, the death of the firstborn, and the events surrounding the rapture and those whose robes are washed in the blood of the Lamb. It's uncanny. You know, those not repenting are just like Pharaoh and his noblemen who did not repent and went after the Israelites. And it goes even deeper than that. Revelation refers to the 144,000 that were saved in Revelation 7 as first fruits. Later, in Revelation 14. And this term is important in understanding what was happening here and how it's further related to the historic Exodus. Let me explain. The purpose of a 10th plague was to deny the wicked in Egypt the first fruits of their offspring, you know, supposedly the strongest and best male children. In Psalm 78:51, it says this, he struck down every firstborn in Egypt the first fruits of the strength in the tents of Ham. So God struck the firstborn of Egypt and saved the firstborn of Israel. Now, as we mentioned, Revelation refers to the 144,000 as first fruits. They're first fruits of Israel in the end times because they're Israeli tribes. These have been redeemed from mankind as first fruits for God and the Lamb, Revelation 14.5. Not only are the 144,000 the first fruits of Israel, they're the first fruits of all mankind. What does this mean? Are they raptured ahead of everyone else? Is that what this means? Let me ask you, if it doesn't mean that, if it doesn't mean they're raptured first, what does it mean? In other words, how are they first fruits to God, if not in that way. I think we need to explore this a little deeper. Let's see how that passage starts. Then I looked, and behold, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb, and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. Revelation 14.1 God's names on the foreheads are the seal of God. And we see they are on Mount Zion. You know, so every person naturally thinks this is earthly Mount Zion. But please notice, there are two Mount Zions, an earthly one in Jerusalem and a heavenly one in the new Jerusalem. In Hebrews 12, 22, we read, But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering. So the 144,000 don't have to be on earth at this point in this gathering with Jesus on Mount Zion. They could be in heaven on the heavenly Mount Zion. And I think that's what it is. Let's continue to look at the context in Revelation 14 to find out which it is. See if I'm right. And I heard a voice from heaven. Notice a singular voice and it's coming from heaven like the roar of many waters and like the sound of loud thunder, the voice I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps. And they, so it switches from a singular to a plural, who are these they? The last plural group was the 144,000. And they were singing a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and before the elders. Aha, they have to be in heaven, those groups living creatures, elders, the throne, all of that's in heaven. No one could learn that song except the 144,000. Now, why is that? Because at this point, they're the only ones in heaven. They're the first fruits who had been redeemed from the earth. These had been redeemed from mankind as first fruits for God 
and the Lamb. Revelation 14, 2, 3, and 5. There's our answer. They were the first ones raptured into heaven. That is a phenomenal statement that rocks most people's theologies. They were the last saved before the rapture, but the first taken into heaven as first fruits. So when Jesus said, the last shall be first, and the first shall be last, was he talking about the order of the rapture? I think so. I think that was a portion, not all, but a portion of what he was discussing. In the parable of the vineyard workers, Jesus said this, And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. Matthew 20, verse 8. So when it comes to rewards, it appears the last saved are going to be rewarded first. Exactly what we said. So the church, which is primarily Gentile, is saved by the blood of a lamb, while it is a minority of Israelites who are saved right before the rapture. This is the exact opposite of what happened in the Exodus, as we talked about before, where it was the Hebrews saved by the blood and likely a minority of Egyptians who joined them. I think that's an interesting turnaround. But what happens to the remaining Israelites that aren't in that first fruits, the 144,000? How does Revelation parallel Exodus for them? What happens to that group? What about the parting of the Red Sea. What does that signify in Revelation? Ha, ah, that will be our next and final episode in the Exodus to Revelation saga. Click right here to keep watching that fascinating and little understood part of the tale. If the video isn't posted just yet, click anyway and you will be taken to another video about the Exodus. Then come back in a week and the final installment will be ready. Till then, this is Nelson and I'll see you there.